Turn to Psalm chapter number 9. As you may or may not remember, we are looking at those who are damned. Those who are damned. And our jumping off point is Psalm 9, verse number 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. And it's very interesting, I'm just now noticing in my edition of the Bible, the word and has been added by the translators. The wicked shall be turned into hell, all the nations that forget God. And when I read that, I said, and as I said last uh, week, who is going to hell? First of all, the wicked. What is wickedness? Sin. Sin. And the nations that forget God. That phrase has to do with relationship. And I say they're intertwined. Your sin affects your relationship with God. You need, a, you need to do something about the sin and your relationship with God to avoid hell. Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Verses 38 through 42. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the study. Lord, we are indeed still in the same subject we were in last Lord's Day, and I don't want to just blindly go through it and, 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 and uh, follow the compulsive part of my nature to finish that which I've started. But Lord, there are other points and they are in your scripture and we're asking you, I'm asking you to please bless them. Put these thoughts in our minds and Lord, as we study these things, may we be reminded that all these philosophies, all these activities that we're reading about are not just philosophies and activities. These are things that are done by individual souls. And we know that people and persons are going to hell just as people and persons are going to heaven if it redeemed by the blood of Christ. Lord, please bless these things and may everything that's said and done here today in all services be for your glory and honor. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Last week I got through eight points, so I'm just going to reiterate those without going into any elaborate retelling or reteaching. But uh, number one, religious hypocrites are going to hell. Jesus talked a lot about the scribes and the Pharisees. Blasphemers against the Holy Ghost are going to hell. They're in danger of damnation. Lost participants in the ordinances of the Lord. The instruction in 1 Corinthians is that you don't take the Lord's Supper unworthily. You bring upon yourself damnation. Fourthly, false prophets who lie about Jesus and salvation. We read that in 2 Peter. Fifthly, those whose behavior is governed by the flesh and not the spirit. Those who, number six, who believe not the gospel. Number seven, and this was an interesting thing and I had some discussion about it at lunch, the children of the kingdom. There's one phrase that says the children of the kingdom will be cast out. Does that mean the Jewish nation in general? Does that mean all humanity? Or does it mean those to whom the gospel goes and it's rejected? But anyway, the children of the kingdom. And then our last point was those without the righteousness of Christ. And we looked at the parable of the man without a wedding garment. He was invited in. He came in. But he was not dressed properly. And he was thrown out. We need the righteousness of Christ. We need to be clothed in that. So that brings us to point number nine. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 25. 
Matthew 25, who are damned? Who are going to hell? Matthew 25, and let's read verses 24 through 30. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast thou that is thine. Thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have uh, not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury or profit. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Who's go who are the damned? Those who hide and bury the blessings of the Lord that he has given them to profit thereby and to make profit. Do y'all remember the study we made on uh, uh, the I shall dung the tree? Remember the, uh, the Lord of them came and said, I've come all these years and there's no fruit on this tree. Cut it down. Yeah. Cut it down. And we know the, the husbandman says, give me some time. I'm not going to go into all that again. But my point is the Lord always expects fruit and or, and boy, this is a word that can get people upset in the political and social world now. He expects profit. He expects better than what he gave. Our pastor says you need to turn your soul back into him better than it was when he redeemed it. And you know, I've always had a problem with this, and this is just a personal opinion and conviction, but... Talent in the King James English is a piece of money, and it says take the coin from him, take the money from him. But I like the current use of the word talent. Every ability you have, you should use for the glory of God and to edify the church. Every joint does what? It supplieth. If you're going to bury your talent in the ground, you're not supplying anything, and you're not growing. So that is one, those who hide their talent, they're unprofitable. Look at Matthew 24, since we're in this part, portion of the scripture, go back to the previous chapter. Matthew 24, 44 through 51. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Notice the other servant was slothful and unprofitable. But this servant is wise and uh, faithful and wise whom the Lord hath made ruler over his household and here's something I've never noticed before to give what's the pronoun yeah. them is that singular or plural? plural that's plural that's more than one right your talent and your skill is not just for you it's for everyone the blessings and the means of grace that God bestows upon you are to be used for others. Let's continue reading. Uh, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom, it, when, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with hypocrites. Remember, our first point was hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. We are to be profitable. Those who are not profitable will be cast out. Those who bury their talent, bury the blessing of God, and don't use it for fruit, to bring forth fruit. God expects fruit. Luke 13. Luke 13. 
This is probably what I just referenced. Luke 13, verses 6 and 7. Here it is. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? So those who hide and bury and do not use their blessings, the means of grace, and their individual ability, they are unprofitable servants, and they go to hell. They are the damned. They are damned. While we're, uh, let's go back to Matthew 25. And as I said last week, a lot of these points overlap. Some of them even appear to be the same point, but we're looking at different scriptures that talk about being cast to where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth into hell or into outer darkness. And notice this. Uh, let's read Matthew 25, 41 through 46. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Who are on the left? What kind of people? For I was unhungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away, notice, into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Who are damned? Those who do not feed, take in, clothe, or visit the brethren of Jesus. He told the righteous, the least of these, my brethren. He told the, he told the wicked, the least of these. I think that can mean specifically the children of God, people who don't take care of the children of God, but I also think it means humanity in general. It behooved him to be made like unto what? His brethren. Hebrews says that. Be made like unto his brethren. He said, you didn't do it to these. You didn't do it to me. I want to ask you something, professing Christian sitting before me. Has anyone's life ever been bettered by you? Have you ever clothed or fed, took in, or visited? I want to show you someone who did not. We read this last week in our uh, scripture reading. Luke 13. Luke 13. Luke 13. And we're going to read first 19 through 23. Luke 13. 19, no, I'm sorry, Luke 16. I knew that didn't look right. Luke 16, verses 19 through 23. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which he fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that when the beggar died and was, car the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, 
Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And now I'm going to stop there. Thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Was that wrong? Is it a sin to receive good things? And to have good things? No. But what was the issue? Lazarus was at his gate. And this rich man did not visit him. Did not feed him. Although he was there to get the scraps from the table. The rich man didn't visit him. Didn't take him in. And you know what I was thinking? I've never thought about this before. The dogs licked his sores. He must not have been well clothed. The rich man who was well clothed, could have given him better clothes. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. Folks, it's not wrong to have something. It's wrong to let your something possess you. And you need to use it for the glory of God and for the betterment of others. And this rich man didn't. This rich man didn't. Look at verse... Uh, 25. Uh, well, and he said, likewise, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. This rich man did not feed, clothe, visit, or take in someone who had a need. Who had a need. Those who hide their talent and bury it are damned. Those who do not feed, take in, clothe, or visit the brethren of Jesus. And here, here's, here's the most simple point I, I can make. One verse, one word. Look at John 5. And it's kind of obvious. But I want us to think about it. John 5. Who are damned? Who will be turned into hell? John 5, verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Evil doers are going to hell. Folks, if there is no evidence, and I have to be careful with this because I don't want to be a fundamentalist and I don't want to add anything to uh, salvation by grace and by the mercy of Almighty God. But if there is no evidence that anything has not happened to you and you're still living in the same old things you've always lived in, to me there's, that's kind of indicative there's no salvation. There's been no change in you. Brother Gary, do we live perfectly? Absolutely not. But those who do evil, it's their lifestyle. There's been no ch remarkable change in them. What have you, the, the evildoers are damned. The resurrection of damnation. Some people are so hyper in their sovereignty and Calvinism, you know, they say, the elect are going to go there regardless, uh, are going to be saved. I don't believe that. I believe the elect will be saved in, the, in their lifetime. Right? And let me tell you something. Can a Christian fall into sin? Absolutely. Can a Christian remain in sin? I don't think so. I don't think so. David in the arms of Bathsheba was a, um, an exception, not the rule of his life. And he did repent. Father, I've sinned against thee. Sin can be repented. But those who fall, and that's going to bring us up to our uh, next point, and stay fallen, they're not redeemed. They're not redeemed. Heard one preacher say, and I, thought, I think this is very interesting, I believe he said it here, it was Tommy Anderson. He said, how long can a Christian be out of the will of God as far as clean living and what have you? He said, two weeks. Ten minutes, ten years, and you know what he said? The scripture is silent on that. But those who fall into sin and remain in sin and don't endure to the end, those are damned. 
those will go to hell. All right, this next point really disturbs me. Turn to 1 Timothy. Those who hide their talent, bury it in the ground, not using it for the glory of God and for the good of others. Those who do not feed, take in, clothe, or visit the brethren of Jesus. And evildoers. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verses 11 and 12. Now stick with me on this. We've got to read some more scriptures. 1 Timothy 5, 11 and 12. He's talking about taking care of widows and all these things inside the local assembly. Verse number uh, 11. But the younger widows refuse. You don't take them in and pay for them and take care of them. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having what? And why do they have damnation? Read it. I mean, read it with me. Because they have cast off their first faith. They've cast off their first faith. Brother Gary, this is specifically talking about younger women in the church. Yes, but it says you can cast off your first faith. And it says they have damnation for that. Wasn't there a church that lost its first love? Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. Verses 4 and 5. Revelation 2, 4 and 5. And this is the church at Ephesus. Nevertheless, he, he brags about them, and then he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy what? The widows, young widows, if they, if they wax wanton against Christ, they lose their first faith. It says here, you've lost your first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Notice that. And do the what? First work. You can lose your first faith your first love, and your first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Jesus said, I'm going to take the church away. I'm going to take away the candlestick. The candlestick are the seven churches. He said, you're not going to be a church anymore. You're not going to be my habitation, except thou repent. I touched on this last. So what do you get from this? Losing your first love, your first faith, your first works. Simply this. You didn't endure. You didn't last. I was fascinated several times on my job over the years. That I would work with people and there would be nothing in their life to indicate any kind of Christianity, any kind of salvation. But if you mention church or something... One guy, I never forget, one guy said, me and my first wife used to drive the bus and we taught the little kids. Nothing in his life now to show anything. And you know what I call it? Because we, we used to, I don't, know if it, I, I don't know how much it's true anymore, but we used to live in the Bible Belt. You know what I call it? I call it going through the process. Everybody's gone to church at some point in their life. They, they've done this, they've done that, and now they've gone on to other things. And there's nothing there left to indicate anything. This man who told me this, this you know, I hope the Lord will save him. I think he has since even died. But he was, you know, a riotous liver. But he and his first wife drove the school bus, or the church bus. And they taught the young people or the kids. And so many people say that. I, one of my closest friends' father died of cancer. And there was nothing in his life to indicate anything. But on his deathbed, he kept repeating, I was baptized when I was 12. I was baptized when I was 12. He'd been through the process. I don't know that he had been redeemed. These people do not endure. You can lose your first faith, your first love, and your first works. I'm encouraged that Jesus tell the people at Ephesus, repent. Or I'm going to take the candlestick away. Folks, I don't think there's any reason for us on this side of glory to ever be without hope. You know who, you know who knows who the elect are? God does. 
I think about that phrase in Revelation about the people before the throne. There is a number no man can number. Most people say, well, that means that's a lot of people. I also think no man can number them. I can't say, you're elect, you're not. I believe they're elect, they're not. No man can do that. God has already done it. God has already done it. But they did not endure. Matthew 10. Matthew 10. We're going to look at some familiar scripture. Matthew 10, verse 22. Matthew 10, 22. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Enduring to the end is a, is a evidence of being saved. Look at a companion scripture, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Verses 12 and 13. And because iniquity shall abound, the love, notice that, I think about first love, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, if Christ Jesus has told us in more than one occasion, or in more than one gospel, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved, then who shall be lost? Those who do not endure. Those who do not endure. Do you know in a couple of times in the history of this assembly we've had to uh, clear out our membership role? And do you know dozens of people have been removed? They don't come anymore. Don't know anything about them. Don't know where some of them are. I'm ashamed to say it, the last time we did it, there was a lady who, when she joined, I wrote it down in the book. It's written in my handwriting, and I didn't remember her. Did not remember her. I'm not going to say it has to be tied to membership, but there, there's a point of not enduring. People didn't endure. People did not endure. Hebrews chapter number 6. And this assembly has been around this chapter a lot in recent days. Several different messages. Hebrews chapter number 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and notice that, once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift. All right, they've been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. And this is, this is awe-striking all, all to me. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify them to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Look at verse number 8. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. I was talking to... Sister Sandra, before I got started this morning, when I was thinking about that, and boy, I've heard a lot of teaching on this and preaching on this. Most of it, I think, is very accurate. But folks, you can come real close and still miss. Uh, our pastor is fond of saying, Jesus kissed the door but didn't get in. But it says you can be partakers of the Holy Ghost. Heard some people say, if the Holy Ghost falls on you, He saves you. I don't necessarily believe that. There have been men who uh, blessed Israel. Was it, who was it? Balaam? And he was not of God. But he blessed Israel. I, I, you know what I think that took? The Holy Spirit. Being partakers. Of, you can come very close and still miss it. And the Bible says, quench not the Spirit. The Spirit can be quenched. And, I, and I, knew there, I knew there was something else you could do with the Holy Spirit, and I couldn't find it until the Lord gave it to me up here while I was talking to Sister Sandra. You can grieve Him. You can grieve Him. Folks, dealing with the Lord, dealing with His Word, is a very serious business. And you better be consistent, 
and you better endure and you better be serious about it because you can come mighty close. Remember last week I said most, a lot of these points have to do with people who are religious. Not just somebody out in the world who hasn't heard the, the verbal gospel preached. They've got, the, they've got creation. But they're, you know, they're lost and never been. A lot of people who, you know, you rub elbows, you rub elbows with, uh, with God, you're responsible. You're responsible. So, that, those are 12 that I've found in studying. Religious hypocrites. Blasphemers against the Holy Ghost. Those who participate in the ordinances left by Christ who are lost. False prophets who lie about Jesus and salvation. Those whose behavior is governed by the flesh, not the spirit. Those who believe not the gospel. The children of the kingdom. Those without the righteousness of Christ. Those who hide the blessings and the means of grace and the individual abilities God's given them and are unprofitable. Those who do not feed, take in, clothe, or visit the brethren of Jesus. Evildoers and those who have cast off their first faith, their first love, and their first works. It's a serious business, isn't it, Brother Gary? Yes, it is. Hell's a terrible place. Who and what is the hope for hell-bound people? Hell-bound sinners. 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. Verses 9 through 18. 2 Peter 3, 9 through 18. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation, we know what that means, manner of life, and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory now and forever. Amen. Our who and what is Christ Jesus. Amen. John 3. John 3. Verses 14 through 21. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God." And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, 
that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Those who are damned. <clears throat>